If you catch me on a Wednesday, I just might not have anything left. But if it's Tuesday night, I'm ready to talk Trek with my pals. It's Mission Log Live. I'm John Champion. And I'm Ken Ray. Yes, it is Mission Log Live. That's the show where we, your Star Trek pals, and you, our Star Trek pals, get together and chat. You know the drill. We talk about Star Trek and science fiction, but we talk about all kinds of other things, too. You tell us what you want to talk about, which means you have to get in touch with us, which means I'm going to tell you how to do that. You can click on the link to join our Zoom meeting, or you can use the one tap from your smartphone. You can also call us like the kids used to do when we were kids. 669-900-6833 is the phone number to call. 669-900-6833. Then you enter the meeting code that you'll find in the show description and the comments, and then you are on with us as whatever intended. Joining us this week, oh, she's going to blind us with science. Dr. Erin McDonald from Dr. Erin Explains the Universe is here. Well, she will be here. She's coming up in just a moment. So get your questions and comments in now. Join the Zoom meeting. Use the one tap from your smartphone or call 669-900-6833. Oh, Ken, as I like to do every week, I like to say hello to the people who are joining us right now in the chat. There's Wes. There's William, there's Paul Wright, there's John McQuillan, there's Carlos. Nice to have you back uh, with us all. And uh, let's see, Ron and Myra and Samuel and so many people who are saying hello. So hello back to all of you. And uh, I see questions already coming in for Dr. Aaron. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I see you leaving them in the chat, but we hope that you also will give us a call or click that Zoom link and and join us live because that's part of the fun. So thank you, as always, to everyone who is watching live on Facebook or YouTube. And thank you to the people who are catching the video later as well. And finally, thank you to the people who are listening to the audio-only version of the show. You can search for Mission Log Live wherever you get your podcasts or make it super easy. Go to podcast.roddenberry.com where you will find links to all of our shows. That would be Mission Log, Mission Log Live, The Trek Files, Women at Warp, Priority One, and just hit subscribe all across the board. And you know that this is coming wherever or whenever you're watching or hearing this show. Head to the source, hit like, hit share, write a review, give us five stars. What I'm saying is share the love because you know, love is old, love is new, love is all. Love is you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, a different, uh, it was a different song this week, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. It's yeah. uh, because my little band, Ken, you may not have heard of them, called the Beatles. Called oh. The Beatles. They oh, were, okay. Before Paul McCartney was in Wings, he was in a band called The Beatles. little trivia for you there. What? You know, I actually knew a person who said that, and they weren't, <laughs> no. they weren't kidding. Yeah, it was many, many no. years ago, and she was yeah. of an age where you could expect her to say that, except yeah. she was also from this planet. So I don't understand how that happened. Uh, So we got a couple of things we want to tell you about coming up, uh, including a couple of things in the Sansar space. Oh, golly, we are just, what, 48 hours, I think, away from uh, the next event in Sansar. Uh, Rod Roddenberry is going to be showing off the short film uh, Instant. But it won't just be Rod Roddenberry there. He'll be there with Alex Albrecht and Tony Janning. They'll be hosting a screening party for the short film Instant. Uh, So what you do, if you haven't done it yet, go to sansar.com, sign up for your free uh, account. And if you have, you know, the whole uh, virtual reality stuff, either an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift, you can go and virtually stand around in like, you know, a 3D space with all those people. Now, if you don't have the headset, but you can still run Windows, and I was wrong, by the way, I've been saying that it's Windows 10, but it actually goes all the way back to Windows 7, I think I heard the other day. Uh, wow. You can actually still log into Sensar and still take part. Uh, you'll actually be, you know, typing and texting. You won't, you know, have that whole 3D feel, but you can still be there and be part of it. You know, post your questions, get answers, and uh, watch the film. So that is Thursday night. I've got here 7 p.m. John, is it seven or eight? It's eight o'clock. That would be. It's eight uh, o'clock. Big. Okay. But but I in two. So. That's then seven wait. o'clock. Totally on. Well, hold on. Well, see. Well, yes, but we'll get to we'll get to two weeks from now in a minute. That's uh, eight p.m. Pacific, eleven p.m. Eastern. So that is Thursday night in Sansar, and then uh, two weeks after that, join us for uh, the next round of Star Trek trivia. The first of what could be one, might be two, <laughs> could even be three different trivia things that are going on between now and the end of the year. We're 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 considering sort of a tournament. 
And if we have enough people show up that we're like, oh, sorry, we didn't have time to get to everyone this week, then that will be round one of the tournament. If on the other hand, everybody's there and there's like, yeah, well, this was fun for the one time. We'll be like, okay, well, that was a short tournament then, wasn't it? <laughs> that is the uh, 13th of September at uh, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern on Thursday, uh, the 13th of September. So that's a lot of stuff going on there. But of course, we got a lot of stuff going on tonight, too. Yeah, as we do, you know, we like to post a uh, poll question every week. And uh, last week, we wanted to know, as we were talking about special effects and that kind of thing, uh, makeup with Lisa Hansel, we wanted to know practical or CG. And uh, because 73% of you are right, 73% of you said practical, 27% said CG. Um, Ken, I will just, I will always go in favor of the practical effects, practical models. I know. See, I don't feel like I don't feel like it was honestly a fair question because try making. I watched um, the Avengers, um, whatever Infinity War, the third Avengers movie, okay. uh, yeah. earlier this week, and try making that with practical effects. You just can't. I mean, there are some times where where the CG effects don't work, but then there are other times where they do. Um, generally speaking, like I say, ships, buildings, things like that. I'm all for CG. Uh, usually, when you're dealing with a character that you're actually talking to. Um, yeah, then I'm all then I'm practical all the way. But you our, know. our questions are never fair. I think that's I part of the questions. They are that's just true. Never fair. Like tonight's question, which is <laughs> but like tonight's <laughs> question: wormhole or warp drive? That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are your choices. Not where am I going? How fast is it? Is it a stable wormhole? No, you get two choices: wormhole <laughs> or warp drive. Decide for yourself what we're asking, and then cast your vote. Uh, so far, people are all over the warp drive. 87% say warp drive. Uh, 13% say wormhole. I think they're afraid it's not stable. Either that or they'll end up in the Dominion War. Could be one of those two mm-hmm. things. Yeah. But anyway, uh, wormhole or warp drive, uh, you can answer that question all the way through the end of this show. And then after this show, you can keep answering it all the way till the start of next week's show. So, uh, <laughs> so there you go. All right. Well, let us, without further ado, say hello to our special guest. Now, normally, I tell you that she's Erin McDonald, who holds a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Glasgow. I might also tell you something about how she consults with the entertainment industry on all matters of science. I could even tell you about the video series called Dr. Erin Explains the Universe. But what I really want to do is share what Michelle Speck from Star Trek Continues said about Aaron after learning that she would be tonight's guest. And I quote, she is the coolest chick in the world and I'm super psyched to be getting to know her for reals. That's all caps with multiple exclamation points. She is one of the sharpest, neatest human beings on the planet and turned my nieces on to science. That's uh, about as ringing an endorsement as you can possibly get. So welcome to the show, Dr. Aaron. Wow, thank you. That is one heck of an introduction. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I didn't even have to write it, which was uh, the best part. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, good times. All right. Well, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, this is a pleasure. Excellent. So uh, give us the, the background, if you will. Just give us a little bit of your science background, what you got you from there to here. Yeah, well, I mean, people hear that I did my doctorate in Glasgow, and I am not... Uh, I do not have the Scottish accent that everyone is excited to hear when they (laughs) hear McDonald in Glasgow. I actually grew up in the U.S. Um, I went to the University of Colorado Boulder, studied physics and math, um, just had a huge passion for it, and then had an opportunity to move to Scotland to do my uh, graduate school. So I picked up and moved there, and I studied gravitational waves and general relativity. So when I was doing my degree about 5% of people will have heard of gravitational waves. Now we're at about 50, thanks to a Nobel Prize (laughs) last year. Um, So, but I do have to caveat that with saying that I did leave the collaboration before they made their prize winning discovery, but it's fine. We're not bitter. Yep. I listened to Darlin. Yep. No worries. (laughs) But yes. um, So while I was studying my, um, my PhD, I was procrastinating and decided to see if I could calculate how warp drive worked because I was a big Star Trek fan and I was getting a degree in general relativity. So I did, as one does, (laughs) um, started speaking at conventions on the science of science fiction. I just found 
being able to combine my passion for science fiction and my passion for teaching was kind of my happiest place. And so now that's how I got sort of clued in to writers and, and more STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, innovation. And uh, yeah, I live out in LA now and, and it's pretty fantastic. So that's the, that's the elevator pitch. <laughs> Can we go back a tiny bit earlier than that though? Because you, you sort of, you know, did the whole part of, yeah, I was in college and I studied mathematics and physics. Okay. Yeah, you know, a lot of us went to college and studied other things, and some of us didn't go to college at all. Why is it that you, I mean, what was it about that that, well, I guess a couple of questions. At what age did you go, you know what, science? And then how did you actually decide, okay, well, that was fun, but now I need something that's going to pay the bills. I mean, what do you, like, how did you go earlier, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think a lot of people go, yeah, science when they're kids, and it's usually space or dinosaurs or both. And uh, then you take, you know, some sort of um, people either have a really positive experience or a really negative experience that turns them off of it. And I think for most people, at least from what I've talked about and talking to others, it's a negative experience that they had one teacher that or one class that was just really hard and it just put them off of science. Um, I, I had those. But I also had a driving force behind me, which was uh, Dana Scully, <laughs> and, um, you know, redheaded girl who loved science was watching a redheaded woman fight aliens with science. And that's all I wanted to do and be in life. And and so that kind of kept me going. And if I wanted to be Dana Scully, I had to keep studying science. Um, but along those lines, I also had a passion for the arts. I was a dancer all through my childhood. I had an interest in film, I, obviously the big science fiction connection. Um, and so, you know, I think you do make that decision when you're sort of going off to college and deciding what you wanted to study. And I just thought it wasn't even like a career decision or anything like that. I just thought that it was really cool to be able to study space. And that's not something that you get to do in high school. And so that's how, you know, the idea of getting to go take astronomy classes and go observe space and go learn more about it um, ignited my passion. I, I didn't really have a passion for mathematics until most of the way through my college degree, because they make you take math if you're studying physics. <laughs> and uh, what they did, I just had a class where it all came together, just all at once. It was everything that I, um, you know, I think learning math is like learning a language. And if you know, at some point it all starts to come together and it, and it feels like you've studied a language for years and you're able to hold a conversation with a fluent speaker. And I didn't reach that point until most of the way through my degree and suddenly it came together and I just loved math after that, but it took a while. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's a bit of the origin story and, and just always having those fictional characters. I had Dana Scully and then later on was Catherine Janeway kind of propelling me towards that science degree. Every time I wanted to give up or, or study something else that, you know, I was like, well, if I want to be them, I got to do this. Oh, this is good. So uh, I, I would say uh, uh, also add to the roster then uh, Aaron McDonald, Starship Captain and uh, Secret Agent. So there we go. Well, yeah, all good stuff. Yeah. In fairness, Scully wasn't really a secret agent. She'd walk in and show her ID. <laughs> She's well, not Agent, Agent Carter, Carter, for crying out loud. I'm mean, terrible about that. Look, James Bond goes around saying his name everywhere. You can't get <laughs> too shut up about it. Yeah, That's true. Yeah. I wanted to touch on one more thing that you mentioned, Aaron, before we move on uh, to, uh, to other stuff. Um, you said that you can't really study science in high school or study space in high school, excuse me. Is that... It's a very different thing, but I took art classes all the way through high school, and then I took, um, I actually studied art in college, and I learned stuff in the first, like, six weeks in my freshman year that I didn't understand why nobody had told me that in the eighth grade. I mean, or, or is it you can't study it because there's not what? There's not, there's not the drive. There aren't the actual scientists there teaching science at the high school level because we're so busy trying to put in other stuff. I mean, what do you suppose the reason is we don't go deeper in science at the high school level? And is it something that we should do? Or do you just, you know, wait till people get out and go to college and go, oh, look, you can do more. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And I think it's a combination of everything that you brought up. I think that some of it has to do with just the availability and the expertise of the teachers. Some of it has to do with just, you know, we have this, at least in the United States, this standardized curriculum 
for what is required of you to pass an SAT or an ACT and get into college. Um, and astronomy is typically not one of those subjects. And I think uh, it does require, you know, to really study it other than at an amateur astronomy level, which is still awesome. You know, you get to observe cool stuff, you get to understand orbits, um, but you do have to do a little bit of math. And I think, you know, the work that I've done with some of the K-12 era, they just maybe never were exposed to astronomy and so don't know how to incorporate it in the classroom and it doesn't fit in those standardized requirements. Um, that said, there are a lot of great initiatives to try to get space in the classroom because we recognize that a lot of children are excited about science because of space or dinosaurs. That's sort of really fun, cool thing that excites you when you're a kid. And um, to try to find ways to keep that passion going, to say, no, look, you wanted to go to a science museum when you were 10. Um, why did you not want to go when you're 14 or 15? And to be able to try to keep that alive is really important. And I think there's just a lot of factors that cause it to drop off along the way. And, and I agree. I mean, you know, learning up through until you go to college is a totally different experience, like you said, with art school. And, and it just has to do with the way you're taught and the, you know, whatever university you're at and the professors, the self-selection of what, who wants to go teach K-12 and who wants to go teach university. One's not right or wrong, uh, but they may be driven by different factors. By the way, that's the second time now you've mentioned uh, space or dinosaurs. <laughs> Earlier you mentioned space and dinosaurs. I'm just going to throw it out there. Space dinosaurs, a Star Trek story. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, we do have a uh, caller waiting patiently. David is there. David, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hey, uh, it's David, our pal from STLV and other parts. That's right. Uh, the dinosaurs, by the way, that's the Voth, as you recall. Okay. <laughs> All right, good, good. You tied it back into Star Trek. Nice, good. Yeah. So the, the question I have is uh, with uh, warp drive um, or any sort of warp travel, what, what direction are we going? I mean, what, where do you think we're going in order to accomplish that, whether it be 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now? Oh, I, that's an awesome question. I mean, I, I'm definitely passionate about that. And I think we're moving in a positive direction, I would say, just in the sense that, you know, in order to have warp drive, we have to have space time. Now that's Einstein's general relativity idea of the trampoline and the bowling ball is how you kind of image gravity that marbles can rotate around it. And that's like orbits. And um, from that, you can bend space time, right? We can't go faster than light because um, when you don't have any mass, you just coast along the surface of space time because it's flat and that's the speed of light. And that keeps us from, you know, we, we just can't go faster than that. And, uh, but nothing says that space time itself can't go faster than the speed of light. So that requires warping space time around your ship to propel you forward. That's the idea behind it. Um, so if we want to be able to do that, we have to understand space time better. And, you know, like I said, I worked with a LIGO collaboration that discovered gravitational waves. That was the first direct detection of space-time bending and warping. And so, you know, as science goes, you have, sometimes you have a theory about it, and then you observe it, and then you learn how to play with it. <laughs> so um, now how we're going to play with it is a whole different thing, because when you want to bend space-time, typically you have mass. You have a bowling ball that's going to do that. Uh, to bend space-time around your ship would require mass that isn't there in order to do that. Uh, Einstein came up with a different theory or a different, you know, uh, physics phenomenon called energy mass equivalence, that you have E equals mc squared. So if you don't have the mass, you can have the equivalent amount of energy to be able to warp space-time. Um, the problem with that is that uh, the energy equivalent, you know, of a teaspoon of matter is the atomic bomb. And so um, trying to, you know, scale that up starts to get dangerous. So what we really need going forwards, and, and it's hard to put a timeline on this, is an increased understanding of space-time, which we are just on the cusp of doing. We're seeing amazing stuff in space-time research, as well as an increased understanding of energy and how we can harness it and how we can utilize it safely because with that fact i'm not about to get in the warp drive ship and i would normally be the one to first in line so yeah i hope that answers your question yeah sure thank you all right thanks a lot for calling in david mm -hmm. 
So uh, we've had uh, so many good questions coming in, and we have a question here in the chat, uh, which might be fun to address. Matthew uh, says, my question is, what does Dr. McDonald make of the Fermi paradox? You know, why have we not already detected aliens? Where are the aliens? (laughs) Says Matthew. Yeah, the Fermi paradox has been around for a long time, and it's exactly it. It's just, you know, especially with how many exoplanets or planets around other stars that we've detected now with the Kepler telescope, there are thousands out there. And that's just in our small, tiny region of our own small, tiny galaxy, which is one of, you know, hundreds of thousands of galaxies out there. So there there has to be some sort of other life out there. It's just the probability is too great that it, there must be. Um, so why haven't they communicated with us? Uh, there's a few great answers to, so my two favorite responses to the Fermi paradox. One is you don't stop on the street to try to teach ants English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is a little more scientific, but also a little bit more um, depressing. <laughs> that is... Um, There are a lot of extreme phenomena in space that can be incredibly destructive. One of those things is gamma ray bursts. And so these occur when stars explode, you have violent explosions, or you have two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole collide, and they have incredibly high amounts of beamed gamma rays. Gamma rays are the most intense of the energy spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, when they were first discovered, scientists were like, well, they have to be beamed like a lighthouse because there's literally no source of energy in physics that would allow that much energy to go out in all directions. And so the idea is is that those probably happen often enough that they are likely to wipe out a civilization before they reach the ability to have warp drive. So it's the idea that it'll take you 200 years to make warp drive, but you live in a hundred year floodplain. That's kind of the idea that you're more likely to be wiped out by a gamma ray burst than you are to um, develop warp drive. Now, that's depressing. (laughs) Sleep (laughs) tight, kids. (laughs) (laughs) And we all want to be optimists about this. And so my answer to that is that uh, the gamma ray bursts, we think, caused the Silurian Ordovician extinction on Earth. So there's already been a mass extinction from gamma ray bursts. So our odds are, are kind of on the good side there. But that's just, you know, how I sleep at night with the dream of joining Starfleet one day. Wow. It's like the world according to Garp when he like was, was looking at a house and then a plane crashed into the house while he was looking at the house and he said, we'll take it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so right. he hit by a plane. What, what worse thing could happen? And then of course you read the rest of the world according to Garp and it turns out quite a bit. Hmm. Uh, 669-900-6833 is the phone number to call. 669-900-6833. Um, I am seeing a lot of great questions go by in the chat room on Facebook. And the problem is for every one we're getting on Facebook, I think we're probably missing three because people are asking a lot. So yeah. the thing to do, 669 or you can join the Zoom meeting. You can use the one tap from your smartphone or call us, 669 um, Do we want to go now to our uh, – because we, we had somebody actually drop in a video question for us earlier. Do you think we could um, – Do we want to go ahead and roll with that, guys? I think that is a fantastic idea. And uh, we'll ask Brandon, our uh, multi-talented technical director, to go ahead and cue that up. Video question from Earl, our our friend Earl. First off, I wanted to thank Dr. McDonald for stopping by to explain the universe to us. I know I myself wasn't going to uh, get around to trying to get general relativity and special relativity to agree with each other any time before Thursday evening, so this is saving us a whole lot of time. Okay, obviously, that's a joke. But one thing I do like to do in my spare time is dabble in science communication in those areas that I know something about. And so I was curious as to Dr. McDonald's opinion on this. I don't think we can argue that we are in an age of widespread scientific illiteracy. I just the debate over the conclusiveness and the consensus of a great deal of climate science at a time when that science and its findings are critical to the survival of our species. The fact that that's even up for debate shows that we are having a problem with science literacy. And I think increasingly we are in an age of technological illiteracy. The original Star Trek, for example, you know, as as the story would have it, I don't know if there's any actual correlation or 
or causation here. But, you know, as popular culture would have us believe it, you know, someone saw this on TV, and we wound up with this. Now, I think the story is actually a little bit more complicated than that. But in an age when people buy de sophisticated devices, because that phone I just held up is far more complicated and you know, far more multi-purpose than we were ever shown this to be. So the question becomes, you know, when devices like that are expected to be discarded <laughs> when they stop working, and, you know, very few people could even jailbreak themselves out of the operating system that's on it, does science fiction have a responsibility to add to scientific and technological literacy in times like these, or does it need to continue to be aspirational and show us stuff like this in the hopes that someone will eventually give us one of these? Okay, um, <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna rewind about two minutes and go again. One, two, three. Hey, everybody! All right. Uh, so, Earl, first of all, thank you very much for your call. That was uh, a really great question. Um, we've all been talking about what a great question it was. <laughs> uh, so there were a couple of things in there, and I was curious about it myself. Um, uh, but, but go ahead and start with. I mean, what's what's the first thing that jumps out at you, Aaron? So the first thing that really jumps out at me in the question is, uh, which we have to, I really have to compliment again, the collection in the background. <laughs> we I know, can't right? that slide. Um, but the, it, yeah. <laughs> but the first thing I want to unpack with that is just this idea of scientific illiteracy in our society. And I, I do, I'm really passionate about this as a scientist who does a lot of communication, because I think it's, a, there's some responsibility of scientists too, to be able to um, communicate to the public. And the issue for me is that you'll have people who may not have taken a science class since they were maybe teenagers, if that, and it was the last time they took a science class. And then they have an opportunity to speak to a scientist and they ask a question and they don't know if that question is asked all the time. They don't have the context for it. You know, some people always preference saying this is a dumb question and there are no such thing. There really aren't. Um, but the problem is, is that sometimes scientists treat them as dumb questions and that can put off a person, not only from asking a question again, but turn them against science. I feel like everyone, no one likes to feel dumb. No one likes to be embarrassed. And I think if they get called out for asking a question that to a scientist may not be, um, may be obvious, then they are gonna be hesitant to trust or ask that question again. Um, now that, you know, there's some responsibility of that other person to recognize that that was a one-off event, but, I think that it's so important for scientists to understand that context and be open and available and willing to answer whatever question comes their way, because that may be the first time a person has asked a scientist a question. And so I take that really 
you know, seriously. Um, but going on to the rest of the question is, is where does science fiction come into that? And I think that, you know, science fiction as a whole is great because we can explore all of those realms, right? I, you know, when I do consulting, I'm consulting with writers who are writing stuff, even, you know, science fiction that may be five or 10 years in the future, like maybe The Martian, for example, and stuff that's 10,000 years in the future <laughs> that gives them a lot more leverage. And I think that, you know, stuff like Star Trek has the ability to give us this vision of where we want to go. And, you know, the technology that was discussed with the, the two, two things he held up, one was a communicator, one was a, a smartphone, um, you know, that Star Trek can drive us towards that. And whether or not that's inspiring fans to get into science, to be able to develop these things, I think it always cracks me up. Like the first edition Kindles are straight up data pads out of next gen. Like that was not a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so, so that's great to be able to inspire us and to be able to give us something to work towards that we want. Um, but the other hand is that science fiction also has that ability to hold up a mirror to us. And I think shows like Black Mirror uh, have a great, do a great job of that. And Twilight Zone did that back in the day as well. So where Star Trek offered a vision of the future that we could work towards, things like Twilight Zone offered up a reflection on society. Both of them are science fiction, both of them are valid, and both of them um, provide something to society when it comes to visit, or when it comes to science and when it comes to science literacy. Thank you very much, by the way, for pointing out that you know, the two things that he held up, because I wasn't sure if between the first time that we did it and the second time that we did it, that, that was put out there. Uh, and by the same token, uh, for people who are not watching the video of this show, but who are listening to the audio, uh, over your shoulder is a stormtrooper helmet. <laughs> I'm curious, because uh, uh, certainly Star Trek is a certain amount space opera, but it sort of seems to have a foot, at least on our planet, in the kinds of technology that we might be able to get to. Again, witness Earl's thing, you know, with the uh, with the communicator and the smartphone. Um, uh, there, Yes, there's probably somebody out there, there may be several people, there may be lots, who saw something in Star Wars and thought, I'm going to study meteors or something like that. But I tend to personally think of it as a bit more uh, space opera. I mean, most people do. Um, what happens when you watch space opera? Are you like <laughs> sitting there going, uh, this can't even? Or are you sitting there going, uh, this is fun. I'm not going to worry about the science. Or do you find yourself going, yeah, well, okay, here's how maybe. Uh, I definitely tend to fall into the last category that you said, like, oh, just because I personally enjoy it so much. And I think you're right. Space opera, space fantasy is another one. I've done I've done summer camps for kids that are science fiction summer camp, like writing summer camps. And they get to call me and, and bounce their ideas around. And the kids all the time love throwing down that Star Wars is not science fiction. <laughs> they just they love that. Um, but you know what? I For me, there's a few things from there. There's always the joke of like physicists got into physics because they wanted to build lightsabers. So that still has that inspirational thing of just, you know what? That was awesome. <laughs> and I want to build that no matter how much merit is actually behind it. Um, but you know, there's, there's always opportunities to teach science, even in the most sort of ridiculous, non-grounded in science, science fiction or fantasy that's out there. Um, you know, I love using the example of Tatooine. You have a planet with two suns. That's hard to do. And for a long time, scientists expected that that would never exist just because they call it the three body problem that the gravitational stability with three objects is just too unstable to actually have a planet and two suns. Um, but there are some extremes. One is having two stars in the middle and a planet far enough out that it sees them as one object, or you have two stars that orbit each other, but they're far enough apart from each other that the planet uh, tends to just stay around one of the stars. Um, and sure enough, Kepler has detected a planet with two suns in that first example that I talked about. And so that has a way to connect, you know, we can say, yeah, Star Wars doesn't have, you know, if you talk about what their gravity generators are or hyperspace or anything like that, there's not a ton of background there. I've definitely got my own head cannon, but um, because I do what you mentioned that I say, all right, we're going to make this work. But you know, for the most part, it's just fun to think about, but we can still mine it for ways to reach uh, kids and ways to teach science. 
I want to remind people, if you want to get in touch with us, you can uh, use the, um, click the Zoom meeting in the chat room, or you can use the one tap from your smartphone. You can also call us 669-900-6833, 669-900-6833. John has done that. Not John who co-hosts this show, but other John. We're no, going to get to totally, other John. What? Well, I'm yeah, totally actually, here. Yeah. I was going to say, well, actually, you do click the Zoom meeting. <laughs> I do. I so do. In fair, it's not really fair to say that's not what you do, because... I know that's exactly what you do. Um, so anyway, other John is going to be joining us in a moment. But first, we have a we have a we have a few things that we would like for you to buy. We do just a few things. So we'd like to remind you about our shop, and it we made it so easy, so convenient for you to find it. Here's what you do: you go to missionlogpodcast.com. You look in the upper right hand corner for the very obvious text that says "shop," and then you click that, and then boom you are in our shop. Now we have classic designs and we have new designs. Those new designs by Carl Huber, who is just cranking out so much cool stuff. Stuff like what, Ken? Uh, stuff like Isolinear John and Ken John. That's right. I finally get my dream of being uploaded to every computer, not just <laughs> one. Uh, Carbon Chauvinism with a Da Vinci twist is there. Also, uh, there's not a lot for the Silicon Supporter shirts. Not a lot of support, rather, mm. for the Silicon Supporter shirts. But there are Silicon Supporter shirts there. I just missed ordering mine in time for Vegas. Oh. That's why I don't have one to show people yet. But I will. Oh, yes, I will. Uh, everybody's favorite lieutenant, of course, Lieutenant J, represented. Uh, bonk, bonk on the head since 1966. You could have uh, stolen some swag from the Ditalics Mining Corporation. And of course, you got the old favorites like Cool as Kirk, Ethos, Pathos, and Logos. And seriously, the list goes on because the list keeps getting longer. And it could not be easier. Once again, you can find those designs at missionlogpodcast.com. And, and remember, they're not just T-shirts. Uh, I'm, I'm told that there are mugs. Mm. I'm told that there are stickers. Uh, oh, yeah. and I, I believe you have a notebook uh, in your possession, Ken. I and do. Um, and man, oh, what, what is that one thing that I always, oh, oh, I know you print it out on, on cloth and you hang it up. It's a tapestry. That's yes. What looking for a tapestry, Ken. There's so much stuff to check out and you can make it your own, get your own truly unique Trek-ish gear today at missionlogpodcast.com and click on shop. 669-900-6833 is the phone number to call. 669-900-6833. Uh, Dr. Erin McDonald is here with us from uh, Dr. Erin Explains the Universe. As she's doing that, one question at a time tonight. And John has a question, actually. So uh, this could be the one, everybody. Fingers crossed. We, we might be able to go outside and play after this because uh, the universe could be explained right now. Go ahead, John. Uh, oh, damn. The pressure just got to me <laughs> um i was going to point out the stormtrooper behind aaron but i figured there really wasn't much of a danger there i don't think it would have hit her so. no she, are you kidding she actually apparently got its helmet at the very least if not its head so yeah, really that's that's my drum man <laughs> yeah. boom yeah uh, so I just, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, the state of kind of like the scientific literacy at this point. And uh, it's something that's on my mind a lot lately. Uh, I've recently fallen into the uh, the whole flat earth rabbit hole. And I just, something that I just don't understand. Uh, the only thing that is like a scientific literacy that I can uh, really explain how that's going along. So I just wanted to know kind of like a two-sided coin thing here. What is most concerning to you right now? And what gives you uh, the most hope right now? Or what excites you the most right now? Well, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I am devastated by the fact that I have to explain that the earth is not flat. <laughs> I, I don't know why that's... A, well, I think for me, when I, when I think about sort of this flat earth movement, which I hesitate to even give credit to, but I, I think that's purely, that has nothing to do with science. It is purely a construct of this like nonsense side effect of social media and the internet that we have that people, you know, controversy and clickbait get, you know, um, attention and not to mention that there may be external players who are interested in stoking controversy and trying to, you know, it with this shadow of having dialogue that really it serves no purpose. 
Um, now, what I feel optimistic about, sometimes that's hard when you live in the denizens of the internet. <laughs> it's hard to feel optimistic. But, you know, things like just connecting with people and going out, and especially in what I do, going to conventions and, you know, pop culture conventions and bringing science to those crowds, you just see... In, you see so many people who are so enthusiastic about science and really love learning about it. And you see a lot of kids too, who are so excited to meet a scientist. And I think as long as we just try to not give credence to the people who want to disrupt it or question it, but really just power through and amplify those voices who are scientists and who respect the scientific method then, you know, I think we can come out for the better on the other side. It's hard to be optimistic sometimes, but, you know, anytime I feel like down about that, you don't read the internet comments, you <laughs> go teach science at a school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that, yeah, that's, it's a great question though. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much for calling in, John. Hey, uh, I, I want to bring this uh, back to something kind of a little more specifically Trek, because uh, there are a handful of questions in the chat room that are along those lines. And one that uh, a lot of people are commenting on right now, John, uh, another John, yet another John says, um, uh, he, well, he basically has a question about artificial gravity. So he says, I understand that among the technologies that we need in order to travel into space, the uh, some kind of artificial gravity which is taken for granted in Star Trek, um, but how how do we achieve that? And and what do you think? Uh, you know, look, if we look at some science fiction, obviously like two thousand one, and and we've done similar versions of that where you have a rotating uh, uh, station where you can create gravity that way. In Star Trek, they'll show people on the hull of a ship with magnetic boots, but it's something very different from being inside a ship that is not spinning around. People are walking around like they're walking around an office. Yeah, um, there's a lot of great stuff to unpack there. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> when you say how do how could we have artificial gravity? That artificial gravity is going to be required for long term space travel, just because being in a zero gravity environment is so detrimental to our bodies, and we're still trying to that we're studying a lot of that. Um, rotational space stations have you know been around as a concept for a long time. We do use you know high rotation to simulate increased gravity for fighter pilots or for astronauts so they can get acclimated to that feeling of, of intense Gs, as we say, or multiple um, gravity, multiple times the force of gravity on Earth. And so we use those. The reason that we've not implemented them in our own space travel, you know, the International Space Station has been up for a long time. And people always ask, well, why don't we have a rotating spaceship up there that could could simulate gravity. Um, there's a couple of things. First is that if you want to simulate gravity on Earth, it's going to have to be uh, really small and rotating very, very fast <laughs> or big and rotating very slowly. Now, if it's going to be really big, that requires a ton of materials to be sent up there and sending stuff into space is not cheap. If we're going to make it really small and rotating very fast, um, that's all well and good, except the detrimental effects of the difference in force between your feet and your head uh, could be just as bad, if not worse, than being in zero gravity. And so that's kind of kept us from going down that route. Not to say we won't do it in the future, especially if space travel, if launching rockets becomes cheaper. Um, things like linear acceleration that we see in the expanse, um, that is the idea that you're basically launching a ship and you're constantly accelerating at the gravitational acceleration on Earth, which is about 10 meters per second squared. That means that your ship is increasing in speed 10 meters per second every second. So when you launch, you go 10 meters per second, the next second you're going 20 meters per second, then 30 meters per second, every second. And that's no joke. <laughs> in order to have that kind of acceleration, you need a lot of force, you need fuel. And uh, as well, that's limited to just our solar system, because if you keep doing that, you will hit the speed of light at about exactly one light year away from the sun, and then you can't go any faster. So now getting to what you were asking, actually asking <laughs> about, which is, you know, the, the artificial gravity we see in things like Star Trek or, you know, other science fiction, like especially video games where you're just able to walk around a spaceship that's not rotating. Um, they come up with all sorts of great things. A lot of times when you look at schematics of spaceships, they just say gravity generator. <laughs> 
here's the gravity generator. <laughs> Go away and don't ask us any more questions. Right, right. <laughs> um, but really any science behind it, I think uh, the closest I've seen, you know, some of the concepts in Star Trek have been good. I, I always laugh because those first schematics of gravity generators in Star Trek kind of came out in the, I think, 80s and 90s. And they have the only sort of scientific thing they have on there is a superconducting element. And it's so funny because that really kind of dates when they wrote those schematics because that's when superconductors were the big, cool new technology. <laughs> and so that gives us some insight into where they were. Now, superconductors, we've not, we kind of, you know, we, we understand and we use a lot, but they're not the big, flashy, cool thing. Um, really, if you're going to generate artificial gravity, you need to be able to bend space time somehow to simulate. Uh, that dip in space time that we live on in, on Earth. And again, that requires energy, that requires some sort of, you know, we've seen these like rotational gravity generators that the idea behind it is that they are somehow simulating mass, that they're simulating a gravity well. By the way, Carlos in the chat has just trademarked gravity in a box. So well done, Carlos. <laughs> well, he's put a TM behind it. We'll see who gets the trademark, my friend. <laughs> I have a question, actually, because uh, uh, sort of going back to Earl's question a while ago about um, uh, the science part of science fiction, one of my favorite authors for a number of years, and I still love his books, although I haven't gone back and read them in a while, um, and I'm a huge fan of Arthur C. Clarke, because mm -hmm. it seemed like a lot of times what his novels did was, well, what they would tend to do, it seemed, was basically explore an idea, like The Fountains of Paradise was about the space elevator. It was yeah. about, you know, okay, so it costs a lot of money to take stuff up into space. It costs a lot of money to take people into space. But if they could ride an elevator up into space, then it's cake. Not really. And, of course, a lot of it was about how difficult it would actually be to build that thing. Um, trying to think of some others. Uh, there was sort of the exploration and rendezvous with Rama of, of what it would be like to explore an alien ship that would just be sort of on its way through. They're not stopping to say, hey, there's not even anybody on board the ship. We need to rendezvous. We need to study what we can. We need to get off really quickly because otherwise, who knows where we're going to end up. To me, his novels were always fun because they sort of, they explored a science idea using science fiction to do it as opposed to, you know, space opera. And there's a little bit of science stuff around for, for looks. I'm curious, is there an author? Is there a filmmaker? Is there a TV show? Actually, I kind of want the answer to all three, but if you just want to pick one, that's fine. Uh, is there one that you look at and go, ah, Yes. I see science there, and it's a good read as well, as opposed to, oh, yeah, that's really great if you want to fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it, that's, yeah, that's a, really good, that's a really good question. I think one that comes to mind for me was um, that's a little less known as Alistair Reynolds um, wrote Pushing Ice. So I think he's a British author. Um, so that's what, I was exposed to Alistair Reynolds when I was in the U.K., um, so I don't think he's as well known over here, but I really, it's a similar thing, right? And I think his books are similar to like The Expanse, that it's not 10, 20 years in the future. It's maybe a hundred years or so in the future when exploring our solar system is kind of common and the stuff that comes out of that. But the science is good and, and it makes you think. Um, obviously, I have to mention The Martian, like as it's popular for a reason. And I think some of that has to do with the fact that it was written by an aerospace engineer. And, you know, he really put a lot of thought into this idea of um, what it would be like to be on Mars. And even though the fundamental plot driving event of a giant windstorm on Mars was a little exaggerated with respect to the science, because wind on Mars gets high velocities, but it does not push because the air is so thin on Mars. Um, but without that, you wouldn't have a story. <laughs> and the rest of it I find really intriguing and very um, very accessible to people who may not be science fiction readers. Um, my personal favorite of, you know, putting Star Trek aside, because that's an obvious, but my personal favorite of all time is actually the video game series Mass Effect. I think they put so much thought into their science behind it. A lot of it is it's it's made up <laughs> it's you know they they utilize things like dark energy which is a great catch-all for science fiction because we literally know nothing about dark energy other than there's some weird negative pressure in our universe but they use it in a very clever way and they go to the lengths to explain their interstellar travel 
they're faster than light drive, they're artificial gravity. Everything is sort of explained really well. And it's called mass effect because of that reason. And so for me, I think being able, even in a video game, to utilize hard science fiction is just, it's awesome. It's fantastic. Very cool. Hey, uh, I know John has been excellent in prepping you for the fact that we're going to do the lightning round in just a moment. Ooh. Because oh. it's one of his favorite things to do is remind yeah. people that we have a lightning round oh. coming up. Man, about that. Aaron, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So hang All on right. for that, Aaron. But uh, before we do that, we do have something for everybody to do a few minutes after the lightning round. After our show, please stay on Facebook and catch the live recording of Priority One, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. They are going a little late tonight. So get up, stretch your legs, grab a drink. Don't smoke them even if you do have them because it's bad. But, you know, take some time. And then come back. Normally it's 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific. Elijah, Kenna, and Anthony bring you news from all over the Star Trek multiverse. Uh, it's TV and movie news. It's gaming news. It's literary reviews, plus a bunch of other stuff, too. Uh, like I say, normally it's at 11 uh, Eastern, 8 Pacific. Tonight they're kicking off at 11.30 Eastern, 8.30 Pacific. So, like I say, get a snack. Maybe write to a friend. When's the last time you wrote a letter for crying out loud? And then I come back about a half an hour after we're done and catch Priority One, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast, streaming live as it happens, facebook.com slash Priority One podcast. I know you people on the East Coast, that's awfully late for you to get started on something new. So if you can't do that, they publish on Friday. So podcast.roddenberry.com, and you can check out all the latest shows from the Roddenberry Podcast Network, including, of course, Priority One. Hey, Ken, you'll be glad to know that uh, Thomas in the chat says Priority One equals priority fun. Oh, well, that's that's see. good. Thomas doing their yeah. marketing for them. So thank you for that. We'll TM. pass that along. Yeah. Is there, is there a TM after that one? No, there isn't. Might... Carlos is going to grab it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. you know, he's going to trademark that. I know he will. He's on the phone to the patent office right now. Is it the yep. patent office that handles the TMs? I think it is. Yeah, sure. MTM was something different. <laughs> All right. So it's time for the lightning round. Uh, as I say to people who John forgets to tell, um, uh, you live in the West, so you have some idea of what a lightning round would be. I would throw something at you. You would answer as quickly as you possibly could. And that is the way our game and so many games like it are played. Are you ready, uh, as, Dr. Aaron? As ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> Excellent. That's the spirit. Uh, yeah. Favorite Star Trek movie? Uh, the one with the whales. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah, but it's the uh, official title. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, favorite Star Trek episode? Oh, uh, all right. Fast as possible. Counterpoint. Voyager. Ooh. Wow. A little Voyager love. Good. Uh, favorite science officer? Oh, oh, Spock. Sure. Because, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, your favorite technology from Trek? Trek Warp Tech. Drive. Warp, warp drive. drive. There you yeah. go. Now, which leads right into our next question. Your favorite warp speed? Oh, not 10. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with uh, we'll go with 9.9. Let's push the limits without going over. Okay. Uh, favorite character from the holodeck? Oh, holodeck Barkley. Ooh. Oh, interesting. Wow. Okay. Wow, wow. that really, okay. Yes, the judges, which is pretty much two guys talking in my head, will accept that because you're right. Totally different guy. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, if, if I do need a backup, then it's the bartender from Fairhaven. Wow. Okay, good. Some really specific choices. I like this. <laughs> uh, favorite Star Trek antagonist? Uh, Kai Wynn. Love to hear. Whoa. Hate him. Whoa. Uh, yeah. I hate mm. Kai Wen. <laughs> she's the antagonist, Ken. She's the I antagonist, know. the ultimate antagonist. Yes. Uh, favorite beast from Star Trek. Note Kai Wen cannot be used there. I already used Kai Wen for the favorite <laughs> antagonist. Um all right, let's let's get controversial. Um the uh, tardigrade, space tardigrade. Ooh, okay. See, this is a whole thing we didn't get into. You were speaking at STLV. You're talking about uh, uh, the mycelial network and the science of discovery. We have to have you back for a whole other show. We got to do it. Yeah, all right. Uh, have you seen the animated series? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. That's that's. Okay. I mean, we say there are no right answers, but that's the right answer. Oh, okay. I, so, I, was, yeah. I was afraid you were going to quiz me on it. Yeah, I've watched it. It's on Netflix. Thank you. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 
It's it's been too many years now since I've watched it, so I couldn't possibly quiz you. I mean, I, there's okay. one episode I could quiz you about because it's one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek. Period. Mm. But otherwise, no, I can't really do that. Uh, date night, uh, Doctor Aaron, uh, Arboretum or Ten Forward? Oh, Ten Forward. All right, nice. and the last question that we ask everybody: uh, Have you ever been to Vulcan, Alberta, Canada? I have not, but my friend drove through and like live recorded the whole thing for me. <laughs> nice. Oh, cool. We're a lot of answers like that. Like, no, but my friend has. We get yeah. that. So that's that's cool. I I well now a lot of my Star Trek pals have, assuming that everybody listening is a Star Trek pal. So uh, so yeah, we're we're angling to get invited one day. One day. Working on it. Working on it. We have just like three hundred more shows, and I'm sure that we'll. Uh, I'm sure that we'll be there. Hey, uh, it, since we just have a few minutes to go before we uh, have to wrap things up, I do want to ask: Can you give us kind of the nutshell version? Uh, this was your first STLV, and you were there talking about the science of discovery. Tell us a little bit about your experience at the convention, and a little bit about that panel. And uh, like I said, that just opens you up to an invitation to come right back and <laughs> uh, and talk about that next time. Absolutely, yeah. I Star Trek Las Vegas was a big thing for me. That was, I have been wanting to go for a long time and it was an honor that my first time would be as a speaker there. And I, um, so I talked about physics in Star Trek, which we've gotten into on this, but I also gave a talk on the science and discovery. And it was something that I had done when discovery was airing that it would air. And then two days later, I did a live like discussion of the science in it without knowing what was coming. Um, having modeled myself as a warp drive expert, I really shot myself in the but with that one, because <laughs> I now know more about like spores and tardigrades than I ever thought I would do. <laughs> I've never been a biology person and suddenly I had to learn biology. Um, and also biology as physics and physics as biology is kind of not a thing. Um, <laughs> the smaller you get, biology becomes physics. But leaving that, it was fun. I think everyone has a great, you know, <laughs> we all kind of view it the same way. It's just, you know, it's fun story. They have a good vessel for storytelling. Um, I've enjoyed it. We can poke holes in it left, right, and center. Just remember that the Milky Way galaxy is not the entire universe. That is like saying the state is the same thing as a country. So that's the only thing that I have to leave, make sure that I've said. <laughs> I've ah, done my ah, Okay, okay. I, I can't remember, do, do they do that? Do they mistake galaxy for universe and yeah, that the, the, the mycelial network allows them to travel anywhere in the universe and i was like oh but like star trek is just in the milky way galaxy well, so yeah. but it, it happens yeah. all the time in science fiction it's the only thing that i will ever get cranky about everything else i'm like bring it on let's talk about it let's make it work the only time i'm like yeah you can't say that you arrived in los angeles and go woohoo we made it you know to <laughs> the United States. And you know, it's just, yeah, that's, that's the only thing. Cosmological address is a thing. By the way, I'm not saying that anybody here can make it happen, but uh, John McQuillan in the chat says you should get a cameo on discovery as Tilly's sister or cousin. Oh, that would be mm -hmm. an honor. Thank you. <laughs> so, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Please make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. And uh, remind us and everybody who's watching how we can find you and what you're up to next. Uh, so you can find me most of the time on Twitter at Dr. Aaron Mack. That's D-R-E-R-I-N-M-A-C. Um, you can also find me at AaronPMacDonald.com where you see all my convention appearances. And uh, up next, I will be heading to Dragon Con. And uh, after the weekend after that, I'll be at Rose City Comic Con giving my Science of Star Trek talks. So if you're in the area, come say hi. I travel all over the United States. And then, um, like I said, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see any other live streams or, or interviews or anything else like that that I'm doing. So thank you very much for having me. I feel like a dope uh, Rose City is which city? Portland. Thank you. Okay. Oh, no problem at all. No, I just thought, hey, is that near here? Because maybe, <laughs> but that's not near here. So maybe not. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Portland, Oregon, but you never Well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm really excited that, uh, that John's already asked you if you'll be back on again, because especially as we start to gear up for season two of Discovery, it would be great to sort of revisit uh, some of the science of, uh, of uh, season one. And then, oh, yeah. uh, I don't know, maybe we could find another thing or two to talk about as well. Aaron, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure. Mission Log Live is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Executive producer, Rod Roddenberry. Technical production on Mission Log Live by Infinity Networks. Producer, Brendan Bradley. Be sure to visit podcast.roddenberry.com for the latest from the Roddenberry Podcast Network. 
including not just Mission Log, but also Women at War, Priority One, The Trek Files, and uh, a little show called uh, Mission Log Live. Go figure. Don't forget, by the way, Priority One kicks off in about a half an hour. So facebook.com slash Priority One Podcast. I hope I got that right. Search Facebook for Priority One. Thanks to everybody who joined us live or later. And we will talk to you next week.